many varieties of gold in the sea. There is the glistening wealth of the fisheries. There is the green gold in harvesting the kelp forests, rich in vitamins and minerals. There is the black gold of oil, brought up from under the sea itself, on man-made islands far out from shore, in highly scientific operations conducted by men of tremendous skill and training. I was helping to make the regular semi-annual inspection of the underwater part of this oil rig, working with the company's chief diver, Dave Halsey, a very useful fellow in any quest for black gold out of the ocean's bottom. There is also the gold of salvage and lost treasures, sought far too often by untrained and poorly prepared amateurs. A gold that more often than not turns out to be fool's gold. The three Pasco brothers were among the eager amateurs. They knew that a valuable cargo vessel had gone down somewhere in this coastal area. They had learned about a trick used by professionals, attaching an underwater microphone to a lead pipe and dragging it along the bottom, then listening for the sound of metal hitting against metal. They heard the sound they had been hoping for. At that moment, they would have sworn that this was the luckiest day of their lives. It was to be exactly the opposite. And for a while, even though I was miles away, it looked as though it would be my unluckiest day, too. Amateurs searching for salvage can make a lot of mistakes, dangerous mistakes. They don't bother to get advanced information about things like uh, what caused the wreck the construction of the ship and the type of cargo. Well, the Pasco brothers hadn't bothered either. Part of the cargo consisted of huge, tremendously heavy spools of lead cable lashed to the deck itself. As they moved among the two-ton spools, they had no sense of danger. The youngest brother, Hub, fumbled with a pin anchoring one of the spools, trying to figure out how it was held. In a second, it had happened. Jack was pinned, held by one leg.
was impossible to move him, no matter how desperately they tried. The brothers realized that if they waited until their air ran low, the trapped man wouldn't have a chance. They had to bring help in a hurry, and fresh tanks. Chuck stayed with the injured man while Hub started for aid. The shore was much too far to get to and return in time. There was only one hope, the oil platform, sitting out in the sea just a few miles away. Why is it too late? Well, it took me 20 minutes to get over here, and it'll take me 20 minutes to back, and he's only got 10 minutes of air left. He'll die. What am I going to do? He's got four wonderful kids at home. What can I tell his wife? I got him into all of this. Dave, that helicopter, when's it due back? Should be here right now. There it is. There's a landing pad up top. That helicopter is our only contact between here and the shore. Makes a round trip every half hour. You're in luck. Thank God. Thank God. Let's see. Now, you said it took you about 20 minutes to get here. It'll take us about five to get back. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You pull yourself together. You're going to have to direct us back there in that helicopter. Dave, I'll take the full tanks with me. You refill the others. And bring them in his boat. We'll probably need them. And uh, bring some heavy line and, uh, well, whatever else you think we might need. Huh? Right. And notify the Coast Guard. Okay. Brother's dinghy, moored over the wreck, it was very easy to spot. got there while they were on their last five minutes of emergency air. The extra tanks would give us plenty of air and additional precious time.
In the helicopter, I had thought of something that just might work. I would wedge a rubber raft between the spool and the wall. When I inflated the raft, it might push back the spool just far enough and long enough for them to pull the man free. It was a gamble, but it was worth trying. bearing down on it would be tremendous. I hoped for the best. The weight was just too great. The rubber had collapsed. We were back where we had started. As I looked at the trapped man, I could see that his strength was failing. The question now was whether this man could last until we found an answer if we found an answer. A diver in search of salvage had been trapped under a piece of deck cargo, a tremendously heavy spool of lead cable. His two brothers had been unable to free him. I had failed also. The trapped man's strength was ebbing fast. There had to be some way to help him before it was too late. With that enormous weight pinning his leg down, there couldn't be much time left. Looking up, I saw that Dave had arrived with the boat. I motioned to the brothers that I would surface and return. They understood. He's weakening fast. If he passes out, that's it. I brought everything I could think of. First aid kit, crowbars, line. You bring a jack by any chance? No, there's nothing big enough. How much line? Three to four hundred feet. All right, give me an end of it, huh? Tie the other end onto the boat. I'm gonna pass this line through that spool down there. When I jerk the marker buoy, you pour it on. Give this engine everything it's got. You can pull that spool up just two feet for two seconds. We'll rip them clear. Yeah, but this is an awful light boat. What if I can't? You can. You've got to. It didn't take long to slip the rope through the drum and tie it securely. The rest would depend on the pulling power of the boat above. I signaled that we were ready.
Nothing had budged. It was another failure. The brothers had been below too long. I sent them to the surface. I did my best to comfort the trapped man. Nelson sent us up. I guess we're getting groggy. He wants you down. How's your brother now? It's no good. Look, we need a heavier boat. Where's the Coast Guard? It's on its way, but it's still got about 30 miles to cover. We'll be dead by then. Not if we can help it. I signaled Dave that he was going fast. He caught my gesture. He motioned for the message slate. said simply, my will, all to my wife. It was heartbreaking, but what he wrote next sent a chill through me, amputate. Dave protested, but it had to be faced. It seemed the only chance left. Dave's message read, helicopter bringing doctor. The word helicopter did it. I scratched out the other words until all it said was, only chance, helicopter. Dave sensed what I had in mind. I raced for the surface. I had to get there before the helicopter dropped the doctor and took off again. Sandy, come back! Sandy! Get up the helicopter! It was ridiculous of us to yell and whistle, but when you're desperate, you do ridiculous things. It was pure luck that Sandy looked back and saw us waving. Sandy! Hey, Sandy!
I just don't know, Mike. I just don't know. All you have to do is raise it up two feet for two seconds. But this is a light copter. Uh, I don't think she'll pull it. Why? What'll happen if she doesn't? If I lose lift, she'll go in. Ah, well, I don't know what to do. My last hope. I'll tell you what I'll do. If the company says okay, it's okay with me. Good. I'm sure they will. Get them on the radio, huh? I had transferred the rope from the speedboat to the helicopter. The pilot had warned me that when he applied full power, the helicopter itself might stall out and crash. But he was still willing to risk his life to save the life of another. By the time the rest of us neared the oil platform again, the helicopter had delivered Jack to the hospital and was back on its regular run. You can't do a victory roll in a helicopter, but there was no mistaking what the pilot was trying to get over to us. He had received word from the hospital. Our man was going to make it. Hello there. I'm Lloyd Bridges. Skin diving is fun and adventure for young and old, but it can be dangerous. So know the sport well and don't take any chances. Be with you next week for another exciting sea hunt.